Hello and welcome to the Leadership Matters podcast, the podcast for people passionate about leadership and organisational performance, offering up insight and inspiration from peers who have great experience to share from developing leaders in some of the world's leading organisations. I'm your host, Andy Dent of the Oxford Group, and here at the Oxford Group, we've had the privilege of developing leaders at organisations across the globe for over 35 years. We fundamentally believe that leadership matters. As leaders, what we choose to focus on and how we show up on a day-to-day basis really does shape organisations and the people experience. So if you're interested in learning more about leadership development, then this is definitely the podcast for you. As it's our first season, we'd love you to subscribe or hit like today to fuel us on the journey to more episodes. So without further ado, let's dive into today's episode. Hello, everyone, and welcome to this episode of the Leadership Matters podcast. We're delighted to have Jude Beliti, Head of Partner Talent Development and Coaching from PwC. The Oxford Group have worked with PwC and Jude for a number of years on a range of leadership development programmes. Every time I've met you, Jude, you've always been so passionate about the field of leadership and people development that you were one of the first people that came to mind when we launched this podcast. So we're delighted we're finally here um, to get into it, really. So my first question for you is where did your passion for learning and development and specifically the leadership part grow from? So I think probably from a very young age, it's been within me. Um, Both of my parents were in education. My mum was head of a um, inner city kind of state school. My dad was head of psychology at Newcastle University. So I've always been fascinated by education, learning, leadership. Um, And then from a very young age, I was really into youth development and became a youth leader. So I think growing up it was definitely kind of part of me and the context um i was brought up to i think entering the workplace it became even more prevalent having worked for a range of different leaders and seeing what good is and at the very other extreme what not great leadership um which is maybe even an understatement looks like got me really fascinated about what is it about how leaders lead how they create the environment that gets different results from the same people that they're leading and I think that is what kind of led me to my fascination in it um I can tell you a little bit about my kind of career history if that's helpful to hear that it'd be great to hear how you got to where you are now yeah sure so I started um out as a management consultant Um, joined BDO uh, uh, in their consultancy, trained, did the accountant's exams, but was completely a fake accountant, Um, did two weeks of audit in my life, definitely not my bag, but I think BDO wanted me to have the accountancy qualification to be more credible with clients, and it was something that quite appealed to have that backing. Um, But very quickly in their consultancy, I was just drawn to and ended up specialising on kind of people related projects um, and was really lucky um, early on to do quite a lot of leadership development for clients um, and other people um, style projects. Um, I was there for a few years and then ended up moving to PwC. A few of my team had moved to PwC who then brought me with them. And when I joined PwC, it was around the people side of mergers and acquisitions, particularly with kind of cultural focus. You know, why do two companies coming together? What's the kind of cultural integration part that needs to happen? So that was really, really fascinating. Um, recession time hit and a lot of that work wasn't happening. So I did a broad range of people projects. My last client facing project um, was out at a big bank where I got put in as the head of um head of talent and L&D for credit risk. It was one of those projects that totally threw you out your comfort zone, was like, how am I gonna get through this? I am beyond, um, it's beyond my experience, but somehow you managed to kind of get through. But actually on that project, I was reflecting, I'm here as the L&D workstream lead for credit risk, this is not my bag. Um, But what I really do truly love is proper kind of real leadership development. Um, so at that point, I had the realisation that, that I wanted to kind of get deeper in the work that I was doing. And I applied for a secondment to our learning and development department. And I think that was about 
13 years ago and then with one year to succumb and turned into kind of a full-time role and then it just kind of evolved from there so I've done everything from graduate welcome induction working with you know two years in and then increasing kind of seniority in the roles that I was doing and then the last seven years I'm predominantly just focused on partner development um, while I was on maternity leave with my second child, I went to Henley Business School, trained as an exec coach, um, came back and started developing a coaching portfolio, ended up then leading our coaching offering over time. So now it's led me to kind of the role that I'm in now, which effectively I'm a sp- in in the UK firm, we have over a thousand partners at PwC um, and I lead the team that's responsible for um, the whole partner development offering, how we look at partner talent and succession planning and our coaching provision. Um, I also have the absolute privilege of working with our African firm. So last year, kind of from a chance encounter and um, through COVID, ended up getting stuck in Africa for a while in South Africa. And then that led to the most incredible opportunity to work with the African firm um, and develop out their partner development and talent offering. So now I do 20% of my role working across the Africa region as well, which is just a fantastic part of what I do. Yeah, absolutely. And you've shown me some of the pictures from your time out in South Africa, which always makes me extremely jealous. <laughs> Sorry <really> about that. <laughs> yeah. um, okay, so in terms of, you've obviously worked in leadership development and program design of leadership development in a number of different contexts over the years both for your clients and within PwC what do you think um, are the develop what is your approach sorry to development activities that you think really shifts the dials in terms of getting leaders to think differently and maybe change some of those ingrained mm-hmm. habits and behaviors that can help them to unlock performance So I think across my time designing and running programs, I've done a range of different things, kind of weird, wacky, more conventional. And I genuinely think the thing that makes the biggest difference is quite simple, is really giving people the time to stop from the busyness of their lives and their jobs to really reflect and take stock on what's going on for them and connect with others. So I think the most powerful thing that we do on a lot of our programs is around peer coaching. So giving people the opportunity with other fellow leaders um, in different parts of the business, but who understand the context that people are operating in, give them an opportunity to really explore what's live and going on for them. And it's been probably in those moments, in those peer coaching groups, where I've seen the real magic happen think people have the answers within themselves but just having a spotlight shone on them and being given the time and some independent challenge and provocation really helps people shift um shift their thinking um i don't know if you've come across um a technique called the fly on the wall but um we use quite a lot in a lot of our programs um technique that when you describe it to people they're like that sounds utterly bizarre and really uncomfortable but when we get people into kind of peer coaching groups so say for example groups of five or six other leaders and we give people each a slot of time um i have to say that it's been really important that we've built trust and intimacy in that group first so that people um, have a bit of a shared understanding of each other and where they've come from But what we then do is give people an allocation of time to bring what's really live for them. And we use this technique called the fly on the wall. So effectively, someone will talk through what's going on for them, their leadership challenge, for example. The group then have an opportunity to probe further, ask some clarifying questions. And then we ask the individual in the hot seat to turn around. Um, as, and the rest of the group then discuss as if they weren't in the room their issue and when you describe that to people they're like whoa no way that sounds really uncomfortable but we encourage people to turn around with a pen and paper and listen to the rest of the group talk about their issue as if they weren't in the room and then after a period of time has lapsed and so maybe 10-15 minutes we invite the person back into the room and say you know Tell us about what you heard, what resonated, what didn't, where do you want to take this conversation further? And pretty much every time you see people turn back round and you see their face, 
say, oh my God, what you all just said just resonated so much and just made me think about my issue in a completely different way. Mm. And I'm able to kind of see things from a completely different perspective. And then they're able to identify some things that they want to take forward from that conversation. So it's really, really simple. Mm -hmm. But that's probably the thing that consistently I see having an impact is just giving people that space to kind of explore their issue in a different way. It makes me think that, um, and you you kind of hinted at it that the the conditions for that to work have got to be right, haven't they? I suppose. So, what are the things that you maybe do to to set that up so yeah. that people are maybe not defensive or or are more likely to take it on board? And I think that is the other biggest thing is in the programs that we run. It's how do you create the safety, the trust, the psychological safety that people feel able to be truly vulnerable. And we've really noticed a shift recently in just how much people lap that up because I think there's a tendency that people sense that the everyday working world has become much more transactional Mm -hmm. and they're really missing that genuine, honest dialogue. So creating that space, so whether it's... So we do, you know, really simple things from whether it's a three-minute story where people bring objects that mean something meaningful to them or Mm. a song that is significant, but getting people to introduce themselves in a completely different way than my name's Jude and I'm head of partner development, (laughs) which is so often just what we do in our everyday. (laughs) How do you get people to bring a real sense of themselves to the conversation? So that's kind of one thing. And then in those small groups, before we get into any of that kind of coaching around people's leadership challenge, we invest quite a lot of time, people telling what we call their life story. So what is it that you want to tell um, about what's got you to where you are today? Um, that's relevant for the group to know and we do we do that for two reasons really one is to build that trust and intimacy in the group but also to give the backstory so that when people are sharing what's live in the here and now you're able to tackle that at a much deeper level because it's not just okay we get that but we kind of like well how does that connect to what's come before Mm. so creating the time and investing that time in really building intimacy in the group I think is really key and we and we hear time and time again from our programs that that trust that safety that opportunity to connect in a really genuinely authentic way is kind of what really differentiates yeah. what we do and then for us the biggest success is when groups choose to then stay together beyond mm, mm. the formal construct of the program so nothing delights me more than so for example um a few weeks ago I got a call from a partner who wanted to talk about something and he said oh you know Jude that action in a group that you ran six years ago we still meet the four of us on a quarterly basis and they're the people that have seen me through you know divorce amongst the group really challenging times in the business bereavement mm, and I still mm. go to those people and we still meet regularly and use each other as that kind of crutch and support network mm. and for me kind of that is kind of yeah. ultimate success and kind of the magic in, yeah, yeah. in what we do absolutely that, that kind of true power of coaching exactly coming to life there and um, what about other stuff that you've used I say stuff because there's so many things out there now that bring learning programs and leadership programs to life is there any I don't know whether it's a diagnostic tool or um, a method or a particular topic or subject, you know, that you think is really impactful for leaders. I think that's really hard to answer because it's such a broad range. So whenever I'm trying to design anything, I do think creatively about what different tools, what different um, methods can we use. So, for example, on a programme recently um, where we're getting people who have been partners for 10 years to really reflect about what they want their next stage to look like we did a range of different things so whether that's instead of a typical 360 we did what we called a friends and family 360 so we got um people to ask their friends and family what do you think about my relationship to my work how does my work energize me how does that take me away from the things that are important so that was something quite different we introduced something called a panel of provocateurs where we got a range of people from different fields to come and give a different perspective on purpose and legacy including um dunston bruce from chumbawamba which the group were a bit like who how does this connect to us in the world of pwc but people saw the connection um the probably the most wackiest thing that i've done relatively recently was when we took one of the programs that i run in the uk to africa with one of your oxford group colleagues and um 
to really bring to life the concept of adaptive leadership where we talked about the balcony versus mm. the dance floor we were able to use the surroundings um that we were operating in so kind of the context of africa to do a game drive um in the evening a kind of sunset game drive which was really about on the dance floor getting up close to things noticing the detail noticing what you see when you're in amongst things versus um a sunrise hot air balloon where we really gave people the opportunity to raise themselves above and look kind of bigger picture more strategic and that was a slight when we were like, how do we how do we make a metaphor out of these really cool experiences? And we came up with this metaphor, not thinking it would land as well as it did. But when the group really bought into, wow, yeah, up there in the hot air balloon with the calm and the ability to see the patterns emerging in the big picture versus Ferrari was an unbelievable um, way to kind of really bring to life mm -hmm. quite an abstract concept. So, yeah, I think always just looking for ways to do things in, in a different way. And that is another level of balcony, really. That is I another think your balcony, level of balcony, maybe like a few yeah, know, tens level. of feet up. But um, yeah, a, a and hot it air was balloon takes the a normal level. Phenomenal. I've never been in a hot air balloon, but I would definitely, um, definitely encourage anyone who wanted to, except if you have a fear of heights, no, like fun, my yeah. husband. But it was so calm and so amazing, especially at sunrise, just to kind of have that peace and be able just to kind of float above was amazing was that the whole group in one hot air balloon or were two, you in two two okay um, and a highlight which was very unplanned by our side was that actually not a pwc participant but we got to see someone propose um on another hot air balloon <laughs> we were like we were all like i think he's proposing to that woman and then when they came down and we all like looked at him and we were like did that just happen what we thought and then he said yes and we all cheered so oh, that was quite a nice moment that yeah, wasn't yeah, planned yeah. very memorable i'm sure my fear of heights might preclude might, me might from, not be the, a great um, idea. From, from the hot air balloon. Okay, that is, that is really cool. Thanks for sharing that, Jude. Um, what about um, challenges right now? Because I'm conscious, you know, there's lo the world has changed. You know, we pretty much see that in all of the reports that are out there. You know, society's changed, workplaces are changing. What do you think are the biggest challenges for leaders right now? I think probably, Andy, exactly to that point is the pace of change. How much and how quickly things are changing and therefore leaders having to respond to that and having to constantly be agile. And I think with that comes a whole load of like paradoxes as well that leaders need to grapple, which is really, really challenging. So whether that's you know, how do you deal with the here and now and the, the kind of crisis in front of you and the the complexities of what exists right in front of you right now, but also at the same time, keep an eye on the future and how do you change, how do you evolve, how do you transform your business to keep it relevant? Whether it's um, how do we marry up kind of technology and it being ever more technology focused, but with the need to be ever more focused on the human side of business. So I think there's these there's more tensions, paradox and dile dilemmas that our leaders need to um need to navigate. And I don't think they're necessarily equipped to do so and probably also because of the pace don't have the time to reflect on how do I bring my leadership to the you know people on this ever kind of this hamster wheel mm. and just going at such pace. So being able to really have the ability to reflect, to be self-aware, to think about a deliberate approach to leadership is, is really, really challenging mm. and relentless. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I hear you. The one that always springs to my mind is that we hear a lot about compassion, care and empathy, but yep. whilst driving performance yes. as well. And how do you marry those two? It's a real, f it's, a, it's a balancing act, isn't it? Completely. It's a real tight rope. And I think the other thing that comes up a lot is this whole generational piece yeah. as well and um, we're seeing a lot and hearing a lot from our leaders around leading multiple different generations mm. who all want um, and expect different things mm. from the workplace and therefore the kind of you know the thing that motivated me isn't how yeah. what the people that I lead want so how do I adapt to that so we've actually responded to that by offering a session around leading a multi-generational workforce yeah. which has been so fascinating the mm. insights that have come out and we've had a panel made up of all the different generations within pwc and every time we've run that session i just learned so much mm. about 
the different generations and, and what they want. But I guess all of it comes back to taking time to yeah. listen and have conversations and connect. But yeah. again, when people are so time poor, yeah. that is just really challenging. Yeah. No, I completely agree that that kind of time piece and there is only 24 hours exactly. in the day and what you do with those hours, I think as a leader really defines you. Yep. Um, so yeah, and, and there's no right or wrong answer. It depends on context and lots of other stuff as well, I think. Okay, so um, let's just imagine for a second you are going to be stranded on a desert island, but before you get stranded on a desert island, um, you can pack three books, leadership books. What would be your free? Is it sunny on the desert island to um, escape from le- the rain le- here? <laughs> let's just say yes, it is. Okay, yes, let's good. say it's sunny. Um, three desert island books. So they would probably have to be... Dare to Lead by Brené Brown. I'm a huge fan of her work. Um, I have been for quite a while. and think that is just a brilliant book around vulnerability, courage, um, and so many other great things that she kind of explores through through her work. So that's a, um, one that I would definitely be keen to dive back into. Um, I've loved for a really, really long time The Chimp Paradox. Mm. Um, and just really understanding how the brain works, um, the chimp side of it, and the how you and knowing that that's normal, but then thinking about how you can put in place deliberate strategies um, and tools to kind of combat that. Um, that's a book that I definitely have recommended to kind of loads of the people that I coach, and actually found it so powerful that we um, used some of the thinking around that with our kind of kids as they went through challenging periods and they, he actually has a kid's version mm. of the book called The Hidden Chimp that we bought. Um, so, uh, you know, you've got a daughter who will increasingly become <laughs> maybe difficult. Um, so, yeah, yeah, so that definitely would recommend um, that one. And then thirdly, a recent um, read, I think maybe you recommended it to me, Andy, um, was Atomic Habits by James Clear. So I really, really enjoyed that because I think it's about how those little things that you can do can make change. You know, we all want to change things. We all kind of know those situations where you kind of want to do something differently, but yet it often is just so hard. So I really like the practical things that you can do and the small things that you can shift Mm -hmm. to start to kind of change um, and put in place different habits. So really enjoyed that. Cool, thank you. And I have to thank you because the last conversation we had, I don't know if you remember, it was a few weeks now ago, and we, you were talking about Blinkist. Yes. And um, I have got a stack, like many people, as long as my arm, probably longer, of books that I haven't read that I've bought. And I thought, you know what? Everyone's been going to, I've heard Blinkist come up a few times. So I, do, I downloaded it and I literally have devoured. How many have you read since I, we? I think 10. So if I can cheat and take Blinkist to the desert island yes. and therefore read like thousands of books yeah, yeah, in 10-minute yeah. summaries, then that might be my yeah, cheat answer. Yeah. Honestly, I the, the amount that I got through... Oh, the, you know the books that you think, oh, I'd love to read that one day, but yeah. I feel like it's quite deep or uh, and just literally in 20 minutes. Yeah. Like, um, and it, yeah, it's been great. So thank you for that um, heads up. No, I'm glad you enjoyed it. But we must make sure that no one can use Blinkist on our that's desert a cheat. island leadership oh, no. book. I, it, it wouldn't but work we'd all come a, out so much more educated. We would, if yeah. We all... Although it's interesting because I've been interested in your thoughts as well. And we're kind of going off track here a bit. But I think it's interesting. Blinkist is a, a summary of, you know, a two, three hundred page yeah. book in, in 20 minutes or, you know, the key points. What's your take on, you know, how you've managed? Are you taking the same wisdom from that versus having read the full book, or do you use it in a different way? I think it's a good point. I think, and I was thinking when you were asking that, you know, if you were a desert island where, where you're like, oh, you have all the time in the mm-hmm. world to read. So I think there's probably both and in terms of there's some books where I think having just looked at the Blinkist is an, is enough. And sometimes when you listen to some of these leadership or management books they become quite repetitive yeah. and the depth, you know, I could have just gained that from the high level t- 20 minutes summary. Yeah. Yeah. But there's definitely some books that I think it's enough to kind of whet your appetite yeah. for it and think, actually, I want to delve into this um, in more detail and I want to I want to get more into the heart yeah. of this. So I think it's probably, uh, for some, it's great just to get that 20 minutes and, and know enough. But for others, absolutely, it hasn't given me yeah. the depth that I really kind of want yeah, to yeah, get yeah. into. 
yeah, no, I'm finding the fact that it's inspired me to think, oh, I definitely want to read the whole book or listen exactly. to the whole book of that. So cool. OK, so shifting on from books and, you know, kind of paper and moving to more multimedia. Um, there's so much out there now, so much content you can consume. Um, is there anything that you think every leader should listen to or watch or consume in maybe a different way than just, you know, traditional books or mm. text? So I recently watched a TED talk um, that really inspired me. And I didn't love all of the TED talk, but it was by a guy called Shola, Shola Richards. But it was more, I came across it because I started being fascinated by the idea of Ubuntu leadership. And I'm not sure if you've heard of Ubuntu leadership, but um, so Ubuntu comes from Africa and it, and it means, uh, from an African pro proverb, and it means I am because we are. And I, I kind of came across Ubuntu in a really random way. So when I was living in Cape Town a year ago, my eldest son, really keen footballer, joined a football team out in Cape Town, um, was playing in quite a lot of football tournaments. And then the, he kept coming across this team that were called Ubuntu. I think one of the other mums on the team that my son plays for, we, we were talking about it one time, and she was like, oh, they're the best team in Cape Town. They're brilliant. And, you know, they really embody the kind of name. And I was like, well, what? And she was like, oh, you know Ubuntu. And I was like, I have no idea what you're talking about. So she said oh, it's a really famous kind of African proverb um, and really defines a lot of, kind of leadership and um, collaboration and, and it really is this kind of idea of I am because we are and I think that spoke to me so profoundly around kind of my approach to um, kind of humanity to interconnectivity compassion so I started kind of really delving into um, what is this Ubuntu and Ubuntu leadership um, and I came across this um, TED talk by um, this guy and he it was all like the one word that will change the way you live your life lead um and it's all around the buntu and whilst at some points there's some bits that i found slightly grating i just found kind of the messages in it really really powerful and i would really encourage leaders um to watch it i think there was one line um again based on a famous african um pro um saying or like proverb that was quite powerful that was and he talks about a story around coming back from school I think he'd be bullied or was saying no dad I'm too small I'm too small to make a difference and his dad said back to him in this really strong African voice um if you think you're too small to make a difference you've never spent the night with a mosquito in your ear and I just loved that line because yeah, I could just literally, as I watched it, I was laughing to myself. I'm like, there is nothing more annoying than that teeny pesky mosquito in your ear, making it like buzzing away. And it's so tiny, but it can have such a huge, mm. annoying impact on you. So he's like, forevermore, I wanted to go out and be that mosquito. But I think kind of building on everything we've talked about, for me in this kind of world of so much complexity and challenge, I think every person has the ability to kind of really make a difference and mm. for people sometimes people do just limit themselves yeah. so I think as a leader really just untapping that potential in everyone and kind of making people feel empowered that everyone can make a difference mm. no matter mm. how small they think they are yeah, yeah. for me is really kind of profound yeah. mm. I'm sure there is a net. I don't know if you've seen. There's a Netflix um, series called. It's called the Leaders Playbook or something similar. Ooh, and it's about. Um, it's kind of got a sports um, angle on it. And th there's one of the American sports teams. I think it was basketball, and they took. They used Ubuntu in terms of their, their, their kind of journey yep. through to you know winning some major kind of honours I'll, I'll dig it out and send no, it to you because I think you'll love it because it definitely yeah. is a different TED talk about Ubuntu <clears throat> sport but I don't know if it's about yeah, the same yeah no team. this was a Netflix documentary oh, cool. yeah. no, so I'll, um, yeah, I think there's I think I'm pretty sure it's the same thing but it seemed very similar in terms of outcome and it was really really interesting so I'll, um, I'll definitely yeah, I'd love to watch that. ping that over for you Okay, um, so on a, a personal level, what about you? Obviously, you're going out doing all this great stuff to motivate others in the firm to, to be them, their best selves. What motivates and inspires you? I think it's generally around relationships. So with the people that I care about, um, so that's 
my kids, my husband, my friends, wider family, colleagues, like the kind of depth of relationships and those connections is what really inspires me. And I think I genuinely try to, so there's a quote that you've probably heard by Maya Angelou around, um, you know, people, um, people won't remember what you said, people won't remember what you did, but they'll remember how you made them feel. And that is genuinely kind of how I try and live my life. That is what inspires me is that kind of having genuine relationships, connections with people um, and trying to make a difference. Um, So that's kind of both from a professional perspective, but also personally in in all of my interactions. I think that is what motivates me kind of through life and just building genuine relationships and having genuine experiences. Um, is what matters mm-hmm. to me most. Nothing better than that, and I lo- love the quote as well. Um, okay, so um, we're going to put our forward-facing goggles on here and think about the skills, behaviours and mindsets that we think are going to be really prevalent for leaders or we think are going to need to be present for leaders to be successful and to drive performance in the next five years. So I think some of it connects to probably what we've said, particularly around the Ubuntu part, so that kind of humanity, compassion, care. Um, I think as the world and what we operate in with increasing technology, th- that kind of real human side of leadership is going to become just increasingly more important. Um, linked to that is probably humility. So humility to and vulnerability but to know that I think no one person knows the answers it's just not possible to kind of know how we're going to navigate how we're going to evolve so it's the humility to be able to say I I don't know but let's work together so kind of being able to kind of foster an environment where we can work together where we can harness collective views we obviously talk so much about diversity and inclusion, which is so important, but even more important is creating the environment where those diverse voices can flourish. And you know, we can see that so often where you focus on bringing diversity in, but it's just not, it's left untapped because the environments aren't created where people are able to bring their perspectives, feel safe to do so, um, are able to kind of challenge um, authority or what said before so I think it is around kind of being able to say I I don't know or being able to create the right environment where diverse perspectives can flourish and kind of leading with kind of care kindness compassion and curiosity so knowing kind of I just need to keep evolving I need to keep learning I need to shift adapt be constantly curious to kind of how the world is changing and how I need to change with it Mm -hmm. are probably the key things I would say interested in your views because <clears throat> I think you know the whole humility thing is so so important but but part of me thinks when I look I've looked at a few reports recently about the future of leadership and I always have this little scribble that I write at the bottom but what about performance and it's just a I'm just interested in your views on it you know do you think doing that stuff will naturally drive performance or do you think you know, leaders need to do something conscious to transfer that into performance. I think for me that relates back to when we talked about paradoxes earlier. Mm. So um, within PwC, we've done a lot of thinking around uh, paradoxes. And one of the paradoxes we were exploring was the humble hero. Mm. And I think that, I think, responds to your question around there is this on one side, this need to be hum- um, humble and say I don't know the answers but at some point we also need kind of clear decision making mm-hmm. um, direction and it's how do you balance that mm-hmm. paradox how do you drive for performance set a direction people need kind of clarity and certainty otherwise we're just like, kind of flailing yeah, yeah. so it's having that but then it's also being able to say at points oh that didn't work or or we need Mm. to change course or we need to bring more people into this discussion because I don't know so I think it is a constant need to absolutely we still need to drive for performance we need to kind of set direction we need to set goals you know we're organizations whether it's profit making or not that are there to achieve something 
So I think being focused on performance, but also being focused, having that humbleness and the humility to um, adapt, to kind of say, I don't know at all, I think will drive performance. I don't mm. think the two are mutually exclu- mm. exclusive, mm. Yeah. but they just do take a conscious yeah. um, awareness that having to kind of operate at both sides of that paradox yeah. is really important. Yeah, I definitely agree. And I think that's so important, you know, for, for leaders of the future because, you know, we we see all this humility pushed, you know, as, as the kind of, you know, the future skill set that's required of leaders. But I just think there's there's that other other side of the coin as well. Um, and in that video that I recommended about Ubuntu, um, he talks about, oh, what's all this so- soft, fluffy stuff? Like, where does, you know, soft, fluffy <laughs> yeah. stuff like humanity <clears throat> have a place in business? But I think it fundamentally yeah, does. Yeah, I agree. And, and we're not saying that business doesn't have a hard edge or a performance focus yeah. anymore. But it's how do you marry those mm. two kind of sides to it, yeah. I think, is what's going to be yeah. so critical. Yeah, no, I completely agree. OK, so the moment that you've been waiting for, which is the closing question, where we ask oh, you no. a question <laughs> that one of our other be guests kind. has left for you. Um, so here is yours, Jude. Um, what do you fear so much that it propels you to exceed your own expectations? Hmm. What a question. So, what do I fear? So, I think my answer to this will probably be connected to something that happened yesterday, which was unfortunately having to go to a funeral of a friend who'd passed away. Um, after battling with for, for four years with cancer, and it was something her daughter said in her the eulogy, which is around, you know, my mum truly believed we have one life and that we need to make the most of it. And I think that is, you know, I've had friends pass away from kind of a young age, and I think it is that fear that life is really really short, and I really try and use that to drive how I live my life in terms of um, bring joy to kind of my interactions, seizing opportunities, um, living life to its fullest. And um, I'm definitely someone who's driven kind of by positivity and kind of get weighed down when everything's overly negative and just, you know, so I think always looking for the good. And I think that fear of life being really short mm and just not wanting to waste it is something that truly does kind of drive me, mm. um, the decisions that I make and kind of, yeah, my values and how I want to lead and interact with others. Mm. So I think that mm. is probably that response to that question. Yeah, I know, yeah, I'm with you, you know, making the most of the time we've got here is you know, the, the biggest thing we can all focus on. 100%. So, mm, lovely, thank you. Jude, thank you so much. No worries. Um, thanks for being a fabulous guest. Thanks for guest. having me. No, our pleasure. It's been great um, to hear your views, and I'm sure our listeners would take a lot of insight. So thank you so much. No, it's been an absolute pleasure. Thanks, Andy. Thanks so much for listening to today's episode. We hope you took some insight or inspiration from the conversation. If you did, please hit the subscribe or like button. And that's not because we want to get loads of sponsors. It's just so we know that you're finding the content worthwhile and we can keep delivering more and more conversations. If you are finding it useful, why not follow us on LinkedIn or check out our website or sign up for our newsletter to keep up to date with upcoming events, insights and articles to help either yourself or the leaders in your organisation. Thanks again. Yeah.